on outset of this evening, August 25th, 1713 hours, this year of the evening at IJ, in association with KPI Institute of Technology, to watch the Hygen's first Nobel Laureate Lecture Series. To inaugurate this global yes, event, it is so delighted to welcome our Honorable Governor of Telangana, Dr. Srimadhi Tamilisai Saundarajan, Madam. We need to welcome our speaker of the day, 1993 okay. Nobel winner, physiology or medicine, uh -huh. Sir, Sir Ross Richard okay. Robert, okay. Sir, a Chief Scientific okay. Officer, New England Biolab, okay. our guest of honor, organizers, dedicated okay. 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 in our honorable man's Facebook uh -huh. page, as well as IGN YouTube channel. We welcome all of you. Okay. The World Hospital Community Agriculture is going to take a new dimension in today's session by our Honorable Governor of Telangana, along with our Nobel Laureate okay. of Sir Richard Robert Sir to the global world. Sustainable agriculture enables higher resource efficiency, the help produce greater agricultural output by producing lesser land, water, energy, ensuring profitability for the farmers. With this short term, the resource stand for our national language. <laughs> that emphasis, music, rhythm, and expression to strictly address to the Nathya To perform our welcome dance for the inauguration of Nobel Laureate Lecture Series, I would like to invite with Monica J. <laughs> Thank you. 
social, economic and environmental transformation. This was told by Irina Bokovo, Director General UNESCO. In line with the UNESCO, a healthy discussion was held between a group of technical experts across the globe on greener environment, which come to the conclusion to form a society named the Institution of Green Engineers, named as IGEN, which is a non-profit professional society. IGEN work towards achieving United Nations Sustainable Goal 3, 4, 6, 7, 9, 11, 12, 13 and 17. It aims to be the solution provider for government policy drafting to develop innovative products which in turn would lead to provide solutions to sustainable greener world and to organize activities through Nine Color Nanogon WebGR Society. In order to fulfill IGEN objective and perform effectively, the institution has structured its members according to their expertise in a particular discipline of engineering named as Nine Color WebGR. The Nine Color WebGR disciplines are Waste Management, Next Generation Transport, Build Environment, Intelligent Agriculture, Energy Efficiency Research Group, Clean Air and Water, Smart Health and Wellness, future computing and safety and standards. Any member across the globe is eligible for IGEN membership if he or she is interested to work and contribute wholeheartedly towards green environment. I am delighted to propose the welcome address on these spectacular occasions. At the outset, let me accord a very warm welcome to our Her Excellency, Honorable Governor of Telangana, Dr. Srimadhi Tamilisai Sondarajan Madam, a multi-talent personality and a much loved leader of all ages for joining us today to inaugurate Ayan Nobel Laureate Lecture Series and deliver a groundbreaking inaugural address. Ma'am, we are too excited by your honorable presence and hope your speech will serve to be an inspirational one for all the participants who have joined from all over the world today. I extend a cordial welcome to distinguished and most eminent Nobel laureate Professor Sir Richard J. Robert. Welcome, sir. An outstanding personality who acum is extraordinary and far from excellence. Sir Richard was awarded the Nobel Prize in hopefully sometime, but the land is a depleting resource and it is also getting you know, the loss of the soil and many other things are problems. 
So the whole and 750 million people go, you know, with empty stomach every day. The hunger. So the zero hunger goal has to be uh, ultimately coming through the agriculture people only and food security for all. Equity, equity. It is somewhere it could be surplus, somewhere it is shortage, but it has to be overcome. And the pathways which you have to look at are efficient use of water and land and the and the improvement of the lifestyle has to come, protect the lifestyle without spoiling the environment and also resilience to overcome difficulties like this COVID kind of times and other things and also the response and effective management by the governments. So the other part, the improved seed it has happened and the genetic modification and gene pools are happening and the geospatial technology, because I come from space department earlier, my career, so the geospatial technology will play a key role and the internet of things, the vision farming will also happen and post harvest technologies to mitigate the waste of food items, that is a very major technology and we have the environment and soil degradation has to be handled very, very effectively. So this is the important thing which you will have to see in the dairy, poultry and fisheries which are actually supplementing the food chain that is very important. And now I think that the, this novel lecture series triggers make, make more active thinkers all over the globe and also come up with original and innovative solutions. All the best to you for this wonderful experience for probably people are watching. And we are hopeful that it will lead to successful end results. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your felicitation at us. You have given a thoughtful statistics on the agriculture to take a new share from sustainable agriculture in the 21st yeah. century. Thank you so much. Let me welcome the next eminent personality who is the board of advisor of IGER, Sri APJ MJ Sheikh Gaup. He is the grand nephew of Red Bharatanatna, APJ Abdulkalam, sir. Also, he is a founding trustee of the APJ Abdul Kalam International Foundation, Rameshwaram Kamala. Sir, please. Okay. Good evening to everyone. Yes, sir. Honorable uh -huh. Governor Dr. Tamilizai Saundar Rajan, Sir Richard John Roberts, Badmasri Aram Master, former Director of ISRO. Friends uh, in IGEN team. I'm delighted to participate in IGEN Nobel Laureate Lecture Series on Sustainable Agriculture. So let me start with this. I heard from my grandfather, Dr. A.P. Jabdul Kalam, who recalled the village community eagerly awaiting post independence for the wheat ship to reach the Madras port so that wheat can reach the village by road. This was the main feeding post of the country in those days. The country used to have hardly a week's reserve and any delay in the arrival of the ship would cause self-supply problem. The situation was prevalent till the early 60s. The green first green revolution program was launched by Sri Subramaniam with the help of the scientist M. S. Swaminathan and entrepreneurs and the former community. In addition, what was needed was, at that time, he told me, a good water management system, availability of the high quality seeds, good storage facility and proper distribution mechanism. These facilities were provided by the government through its various development skills. This has led to an intensive agriculture in the state, which produced substantial amount of food gains and liberated us to a situation where what is called ship to mouth existence. It's a very interesting word, ship to mouth existence. And part of this first green revolution, the country has been able to produce 200 million tons, tons of grains per year. Dear friends, now we are in the year of 2020. We are in the need of 300 million tons of grains per year in India. Across it is more. And we are reaching almost 800 crore people grow. So I believe it's 800 million people every day they don't eat and just they go, they go to sleep. Now we are in a situation we like to start the second green revolution because this, whatever way we do uh, farming, it needs to change because we have so much population. Uh, the agriculture land is coming down. So we let us start the second green revolution. Now let me start this. 
is the right time for India and the globe embark on second revolution, which will enable it to increase productivity in the agricultural sector. The production of kerosene needs to be increased from the present 200 million tons to over 300 tons. 300 million tons by 2020. That is the present year. But the requirement of the land is increasing population as well as the greater affordable and environmental preservation activities will be demand. The present 170 million hectares of arable land will have to be brought down to 100 million hectares by 2020. That's the present year. So imagine a scenario where since the population is increasing, our agricultural land is coming down. So that's a huge challenge for the entire globe as well as in India. All our agriculture scientists and technologists have to work for doubling the productivity of the available land with the lesser aid being available for cultivation. The type of technologies needed would be the area of biotechnology, proper training to the farmers, additional modern equipment for preservation of the storage, etc. The second green revolution is indeed graduating from grain production to food processing and marketing as visualized by Sri Subramaniam. By doing so, utmost care should be taken for various environmental and people related aspects leading to sustainable development. So now let me just talk about this. In each area, so in technology, we talk about innovation. Uh, in science, we talk about innovation. Also, we should talk about innovation, how we can do. So there are a couple of, you know, upcoming technologies, how we can use technology to, uh, you know, enhance our farming. So soil and crop sensors today, more farm equipments are available with more sensors can read everything from crop health to essential nitrogen levels in water. These sensors then enable on the go to applications input based on real time field conditions. Sensor technology is also available to measure the electrical conductivity of soil, ground flow, organic matter content, and even soil characters of pH. Crops connected with YP, modern farms usually have electronic sensors distributed in the field that can monitor for different conditions. In some cases, Gadget sends data to an on form server to cloud to use for computing and data processing. These figures are analyzed automatically and sends instructions to the form's auto automatic irrigation system, which is some process may even add the correct dose of fertilizer as needed before it maximizes efficiency, periodically distributes the right amount of water, can prevent the waste and reduces the volume of at least water. Farmers can access this data via tablet or smartphone giving them real-time information that will require a slow manual intensive soil testing and process the food in the past. Another technology is wavelength management. Urban and vertical the home farming is becoming more popular, which gives growth of certain crops year-round the way to grow, regardless of the weather outside. But one of the challenges is how to create the ideal wavelength of sunlight adapted to the growth of compressed indoor spaces. While indoor lighting has traditionally been used by energy intensive and expensive full spectrum fluorescent lighting to promote plant growth advancing the light emitting diodes in recent years have provided a cheaper and better alternative modern agriculture technology make farming easier and smarter so i'd like to conclude with like this a supporter of the pro gmo genetically modified organisms movements and robots expressed his love of india is reason for you know working on this particular project because traditional breeding approach is time consuming and expensive. Only big agro businesses have been able to make the large investment needed to bring them to market. This has effectively prevented small business, particularly scientists in developing countries from improving their local crops using traditional methods. However, the GM method costs highly accurate and much easier to implement than traditional approaches. This means that countries that rely on crops that are not stable Invest can now easily improve their crops for the best of their own population. He was explaining that I find whenever the use users and implementers as well as knowledge and skill processes are linked and network success come effectively and multiplies. As RT said, a network resources can give non-linear progress in addition to the development growth. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I wish all the best. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sri Shetam, sir, to bring back the thoughtful of Dr. A.P.J. of Dr. Palam. Also, we point about Second Green Revolution at the IGEN Nobel Award Lecture Series under our August Presence of Power, Honorable Sonna Tilman. Mr. Tang, a speaker of the day, the Nobel Laureate. 1990, the Nobel Prize winner in Physiology or Medicine, Sir Richard John Howard. He is going to deliver a special address for our inauguration of our Nobel Laureate Lecture Series. Before his special address, let me 
as invited Dr. L.G. Sumitra, also Dr. Jia Subhastri to introduce our the Global Order Lecture Speaker in the August EP. Thank you, sir. If I have 1,000 ideas, only one turns out to be good. I am satisfied. I have read no Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to introduce such a kind, easy laureate, a 1993 Nobel Prize winner, Sir Richard John Roberts. This baby was born to an auto mechanic, John Roberts, and homemaker Edna in Derby on 6th of September 1943. Schooling at City of Bath, graduate and PhD from Sheffield University, and postdoctoral research at Harvard University. This chemical puzzle solver, Sweet Richard, entered into Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory with colorful bio ideas during 1969-72 and finally published his discovery of RNA splicing. He received his Nobel Prize in Physiology of Medicine for the discovery of split genes. Now the question is how this medicine Richard connected with sustainable agriculture? He feels that several millions of children either die or suffer due to the deficiency of vitamin A. So he joined as Nobel campaign supporter for genetically modified organisms and Golden Rice in 2016. Received Golden Witch Award from American Academy of Achievement, Convocation Award, Sheffield University, Fair Robiner Award, Ross University, and TIE Boston Legends and Leaders Award. Roberts received a honorary doctorate from Uppsala University, University of Bath, Sheffield University, Derby University, and Chinese University of Hong Kong. Roberts was elected a fellow of Royal Society member of the European Molecular Biology Organization and a member of the Advisory Board of Patient Innovation. Roberts has been a keynote speaker at the Congress of Future Medical Leaders and the chairman of Laureate Science Alliance, a non-profit supporting research worldwide with 297 international publications, 11 patents, an honorary professor in 25 universities. We also remember his supporters like Philip Allen Sharp, David Polis, John Kendrew, Jack Stroninger, Daniel Adams, and James Watson. Presently, this Nobel King working as Chief Scientific Officer, New England Biolabs PSA. That our six month sustainable IGEN project, the IGEN Nobel Laureate Lecture Series, is going to start. A warm welcome to our Nobel Laureate, Sir Richard John Roberts, to enlighten the audience with a special address. Sir, please. Okay, well, it's um, good morning here and good afternoon to you in India. It's a great pleasure to be here. I only want to say a few things, but I would like to really put sustainable agriculture within the context of what is happening around the world at the moment. We face a tremendous crisis because of coronavirus, but fortunately, we have science. And I think the present pandemic shows very well what science can do for society. When it is applied properly, it can help us to solve diseases. When it comes to agriculture, we can use science in order to improve agriculture. And the bottom line on all of this is that we need to make sure that everybody knows more about science than perhaps they really feel comfortable with sometimes. We need to make sure that it is taught properly in school. We need to make sure that the public is fully aware of what science can do for them. And most importantly, we have to make sure that politicians understand what science can do for them. I think the current pandemic has shown very well how some politicians have responded extremely well the challenge and others have not. And the same unfortunately has been true in the agricultural field. There are some scientists who have spoken out very strongly in favor of GMOs, who have pointed out the strength of the science that support GMOs, and yet we have politicians and activists and people who insist upon spreading false stories about GMO. And so we need to make sure that our children are educated properly about science, that their parents are educated properly, that journalists are educated properly, and that we present science honestly to the public. We don't need to be telling a fairy story. 
which is what many of the anti-GMO people have chosen to do in order to try to stop it. So I think I'm going to go into this in more depth. I will tell you later on in my talk um, exactly how I came to be involved in this. But basically, I am a very strong believer that science can help society, that we should use it in every way we can, and we should not listen to the people who try to tell you that science is not going to help you. So I look forward to the next set of remarks and to giving my lecture later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sir Richard John Rock, for your special address at our inaugural of our first Nobel Law Lecture Series. We are eagerly waiting for your detailed talk in our series, which is going to come up. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Richard John. We are all eagerly waiting for our inaugural address to be delivered by our Chief Guest, Honorable Governor of Tilnam, Dr. Tamil Say Sandra Dilnam. Before Max speech, I would like to invite our Isaac N. Harvey, Junior Srimthi and Lakshata to introduce our Honorable Governor of Telangana to the board. You are be the change you wish to see in the world. Dr. Tamil Singh Tandar Rajan was born on 2nd June 1961 in Agarpoel, Kanyagumani. Dr. Tamil Singh Tandar Rajan took charge as Governor of Telangana on 8th September 2009 and happens to be a first woman in the world's office. She has a remarkable public and social analyst background spanning over 20 years. She also has an illustrious political career in the last two to three years, where she has successfully led the state unit of a political party to let the other. It's not what you achieve, it's that. Some people say from the Rajan started her career as a medical practitioner after completing her MBA degree in ecology, PGO. She has undertaken special training on ultrasound and physical therapy at Toronto, Canada. She worked as an assistant professor, Department of Gynecology at Sri Ramachandra Medical College, Chennai for seven years and decided to have a brief for full time political engagement. She usually <laughs> made no to his public service and enhancement of living standards of common people with focus on health and education as a prime data. She has grown the hat of being a state head of a political party and stealing it with exemplary management skills and pro people service, my you. Right from my childhood, whenever I have taken a patak, I have been an achiever, told by the community of the Rajan man. But the community of the Rajan is a proud recipient of an international American award titled International Writing Star of the Year 2018. Dr. Kamarishi Sandhya Rajan happens to be very focused towards development of society and well-being of citizens even at last night. We welcome our honorable chief guest, Dr. Kamarishi Sandhya Rajan, ma'am. We welcome you to the inaugural address, ma'am. Very special. Good evening to each and everyone who got connected in this program. In this uh, inaugural address of sus on sustainable agriculture, at the IGEN Nobel Laureate Lecture Series being organized by the Institution of Green Engineers IGEN. I am very happy the organizers have taken this topic, the need of the art and the need of the present position and I really appreciate all the speakers who spoke on the sustainable agriculture. And my respects to Sri Richard John Roberts, Nobel Laureate in Physiology, Medicine and Chief Scientific Officer USA. And my respects to Bhatmashri Thiru Aram Vasabam, former Vice Chancellor Anna University and former Project Director ASRO. His words, even though he gave a short speech, it was highly informative and really appreciate his participation in this webinar. And my respects to Tiru APJ MJ Sheikh Dabu. His words on the sustainable agriculture, whether it is production, whether it is distribution, whether it is storage, 
he clearly mentioned the challenges which the sustainable agriculture field now faces and i appreciate his presence and participation and uh, he is the trustee of the abdul kalam international foundation house of kalam rameshwar really i appreciate his service because he is continuing the legacy of honorable our former president the great son of the soil our india the great former president honorable abdul kalam ji and my respects to dr l ramesh president of agent and my respects to dr akila organizing secretary nobel laureate lecture series agent and my respects to dr b gokul who is also a very enthusiastic youth to arrange such programs and always interested in conserving the nature protecting the environment dr d gokul organizing head nobel laureate lecture series agent and my respects to dr j balamurugan vice president of agent dr hansen edward secretary agent and my respects to sir selvakumar and head of power projects my respects to dr jodi sarupan organizing head agent and my respects to dr subhashree agent ambassador and uh, all the other distinguished speakers guest participants and the two little girls i don't know the name uh sreenidhi and lakshika lakshita who is a very enthusiastic youngster and uh, i really appreciate uh, the the way they introduced me and really i am very happy to participate in this webinar particularly the topic of the day and topic of the need the sustainable agriculture particularly the sustainable agriculture as you all know it's a, a system of staying away from the chemicals and pesticides it's a natural formula and india is a developed country and particularly malnutrition is reported significantly from india for quite long time and i should say the children in india and the women in india they are suffering from anemia and the malnourished children the percentage is more in india for quite long time so the sustainable agriculture is very much needed to combat the poverty in india but it also faces so much of challenges as it is said the sustainable agriculture the production then the storage even today the farmers are facing this challenge and distribution and i should say that whatever may be the scheme which we implement it should have a strong foundation i laud our honorable prime ministers efforts to make the sustainable agriculture the mode of agriculture in india and the various schemes he developed he implemented to facilitate good agriculture farming particularly sustainable agriculture is now complementing this process of sustainable agriculture because it is not only the seed management it is water management land management pesticides and chemicals are used it's not harmful not only to the human beings not only it is harmful to the cattle it is harmful for the land of cultivation so our honorable prime minister introduced the soil health cards previously we had credit cards only the rich people had credit cards but first time indian farmers had form land cards so immediately whatever may be the 
nature of the land can be assessed. He also provided farm assessment kits. I should say the land cars which are provided for 6 crore farmers. Soil assessment cars. Land assessment cars. And this soil assessment kits immediately whatever may be the problem in the soil and which seed could be cultivated profitably in such a field can be assessed immediately. So these are the fantastic schemes introduced by our honorable Prime Minister and I should say in 2016 Sikkim is the first state which has converted all these farming into organic farming. So our honorable Prime Minister appealed all the states may make a maximum farming and maximum field should be converted into organic farming. And the main challenge of organic farming is the soil assessment and the water management. So the, the micro-irrigation project for micro-irrigation for 5,000 crores were uh, allotted in the budget so that our honorable prime minister's very popular words, fed drop, more crop, and minimal water and maximum yield. And nowadays, because of the challenging situation, drought in one part of the country, floods in another part of the country, and water getting water is a very big challenge. Irrigation water is a very big challenge of the farmers, and irrigation projects which were introduced by the government is really very helpful to the farmers. And some good schemes like Pradhan Madhuri Fasal Bhima Yojana focus on providing inexpensive insurance for the coverage of farmers for risk-free as it is possible to get good coverage for maximum number of farmers. This Pradhan Madhuri Fasal Bhima Yojana it provides, as it is said, this inexpensive insurance and it was modified than the previous insurance schemes. And with uh, minimal reporting, they were able to get the insurance, whether it is uh, destruction of the seeds and the farming and the crops by the natural calamity or whatever it may be. They were able to get That is the beauty of this Pradhan Mandri Fasal Bhima Yojana. And when, as it is said, production can be done, then marketing. Marketing, the Pradhan Mandri introduced the e now That is the agricultural e marketing. It is a very big revolution in the uh, farming of our India. and Whenever the fertilizers, when the crop fertilizers, uh, I, I should say a fertilizer revolution is the urea coated, the neem coated urea. The neem coated urea, it uh, provided a good fertilizer and the urea is prevented from uh, misusing by the chemical industries. So the maximum other thing they Urea coated, uh, neem coated urea is 15% more efficient than the normal urea. Then it is as it is said, neem. Neem is also a yeah, natural uh, resources of health and yeah, it provides immune immunity to the land as well as the physical body. So whatever may be the sustainable agriculture which should be Developed in all the states, that was the, our uh, Honorable Prime Minister's appeal. And the farmers, not only the appeal, it's not only the advice, but the it was facilitated by so much of schemes. Even recently, even in this pandemic situation, one lakh crore has been allotted to the farmers so that they are not strained by this lockdown situation. So whatever may be the scheme and uh, agriculture, as it is said, agriculture is the culture of the country. 
all the great leaders supported the farmers unless the farming community is happy the country cannot be happy in tirukkural he says the whole world is behind the farmers so the whole world is behind the farmers but the farming community should be happy and when they go for sustainable agriculture the citizens are happy because their health and the soil health is maintained but it also they also face more challenges because of its cost effective effectiveness and availability of water even though uh, there are a uh, lot of money allotted for micro irrigation and in remote areas the farmers they have to uh, follow the technology now we say the great evolution in the sustainable agriculture is the collaboration of technology with natural farming with the normal our traditional farming plus technology both combined together have given great results in this type of farming so in every day innovative measures collaborating our traditional methods nowadays i am very happy because of this technical assistance in the agriculture and because of the high production in sustainable agriculture and the benefits of the sustainable agriculture nowadays more youngsters are involved in this type of agriculture that i could visualize when i visited the agriculture university uh, when i went to for a graduation day in the agriculture university so i appeal each and every one to encourage the sustainable farming and it is the it is not only for the farmers it is for protecting the health of each and every one and particularly in this pandemic situation we we, we cannot uh, assure the world we assure the country that we won't face such situations in future we may face such situations so the body immunity should be strengthened the body immunity should be strengthened so the body immunity can be strengthened and body wellness can be safeguarded only by sustainable farming we cannot harm ourselves we cannot harm the soil so we should be protected so it's high time we think about it and i really appreciate the organizers that they have taken this topic because this is the topic of the future and whatever may be the farming it should be the sustainable farming and the challenges which the farmers face should be considered humanitarian ground and i really Uh, appreciate our honorable prime minister for giving so much of skills for the farmers and if the farmers are happy only we can be happy and sustainable for farming can lead a healthy life thank you so much thank you so much ma'am for your uh, wonderful inaugural address for our first noble lord lecture i tell you were both you were thoughtful on the government policy by the honorable prime minister of india who has taken a different change in this agriculture and to create a sustainable agriculture for the 21st century huge reforming is taken by our honorable prime minister also the government of india by former it's delighted to see during this covid situation only one industry was working 24 hours that none other than agro and agriculture industry definitely the board were given a thoughtful to all of our visitors you were in the youtube channel and facebook to think of how the sustainable agriculture is going to be a tremendous change in coming days along with the technology pointing thank you so much ma'am for your wonderful inaugural address thank you also i would like to like uh, welcome for our doctor professor mamta who is a former chairman of aict who is going to declare today noble lord lecture to the globe so we come to the end it is me to invite engineer hudson who is the general secretary of idel to deliver the order sir uh, really you when i have to take the general secretary of idel consider myself to be privileged to have been proposed to vote of thanks on this occasion 
I, on behalf of the Institution of Engineers and its, uh, KPR Institute of Engineering Technology, extended very heartfelt thank you wishes to our Honorable Sri, Dr. Srimati Tamil Isai Samdarajan, the Governor of Thirunan. Madam, we owe you millions of special thanks, Kodan Kodi for gracing this occasion with your steel presence and inaugurated the Nobel Laureate Lecture Series and the well extended information on sustainable agriculture. Madam, your kind presence made our institution as a national treasure as you are. Madam, you have lighted the future of our institution and planted a seed to breathe in India and the whole world. Our institution and all the participants owe you a very big thanks for spending your valuable time with all of us. Thank you. I extended my thanks to our ABC of Governor's Office, Mr. Raj Bhavan, and System Administrators team, who made the event a grand success. And an event like this cannot happen overnight. The wheels started rolling two months ago. A big thanks to Nobel laureate Sir Richard John Roberts for your kind acceptance of our invitation to deliver the IGEN's first Nobel lecture. We express our gratitude to you for accepting all our requests. Only with your hearty wishes and support, this historical moment was made possible for IGEN. Your kind picture of goodwill always remains as a memory of IGEN prestigious moment. I must mention our deep sense of appreciation to IGEN Board of Governors, Professor R. M. Vasanam and Dr. S. S. Manita. Also thanking the IGEN Board of Advisor, APMJ Sheikh Yahoo, for delivering the station address. I also extend my warm thanks to our entire IGEN team to initiate and make this event a global success. Also very thankful to our academic partner, NLS, and the chairman of KPR Institute of Technology, Pine and their team. A special mention of thanks to IGEN Ambassador, Dr. Shubhashree, who behind the initiation of the IGEN NLLS. We are inspired and honored by all of your great words. Thank you. so much uh, uh, for the wonderful inaugural which is taken from our IGEL Institute of Green India, the Nobel Law Lecture Series. Uh, it was a greetings from Honorable Governor, also from our Nobel Law winner of 1993, uh, Richard Sir, who have joined from US from uh, morning of US timing. Also, all our Board of Governor and Board of Advisor was delivered the prestigious also General Secretary who was delivered the Board of Times. With this short note, we are going to enter our, the real uh, climax of the day. We are all eagerly waiting for the, the, uh, the presentation about the Nobel Law who is going to deliver a sustainable agriculture. With this scenario, let me hand over to Sri S. Selvakumar, who is the uh, head of uh, the IGEN, also a power project chair to take up this session from now. So over to Selvakumar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sri Gokul. Uh, it's really a dream come true today. 
I think it's a remarkable day, not only for IJ but also for India. I believe this is the first Nobel laureate lecture series which we are starting. So it's my pleasure and privilege uh, to be part of uh, this event. Uh, I thank all the participants, those who have joined directly in Google Meet, as well as those who are watching uh, uh, our YouTube live. I believe about a thousand people are watching in YouTube live. It's really my pleasure to thank each and every individual, those who has made this event uh, successful. And uh, I would say, talking about this uh, lecture is really important. Uh, means, uh, as Google has rightly pointed out, uh, the only sector which runs 24 bar 7, even during this pandemic, is agriculture. How to make this agriculture sustainable is the question. So everybody is talking about the sustainable agriculture. So it's our pleasure and privilege we have uh, our Nobel laureate Sir Richard John Roberts today to deliver the Nobel laureate lecture. This is Nobel laureate lecture series one. So before going for that event, I request KB on me to go with the bites. Uh, we have received quite a lot of visits from across the globe. The many people has uh, misrepresented their views, their wishes, they conveyed uh, across the globe, I think uh, all from all uh, about uh, 60 70 countries we have seen. So the bike has been prepared by merging all the resources uh, across the globe. Yes, uh, then we go ahead with the video of uh, the resources uh, from the globe. Yes, Selma. An IGE and ambassador here in Nigeria and an MSc graduate of biotechnology. Environmentalist from Bizaichi Yemba, Zimbabwe. Hello, this is Sarah from Algeria. The institution. My name is Ali Kagbo, third year student, pursuing BSc Agriculture General, Jala University, Sierra Leone, West Africa. I'm Ashok Bhagwa, and I'm a professor at Wayne State University in the United States. It's Kiara from Mexico. I'm involved working in the organic agriculture fields and also processing food in the natural way. Yeah, like so principal of Sri Chaitanya Techno School, Ayanam Bakam branch. This is Hudson Egbert, the IGN General Secretary. My name is Alexander Masne. I'm biochemist by my first education. Now I work in the field of bioinformatics. On sustainable agriculture. 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 Sir Richard John Roberts. Sir Richard Roberts. Sir John Richard Roberts. Sir Richard John Roberts. Uh, Richard John Roberts. I'm so excited to attend this event online with my families and friends on August 25th, 2020. Global lecture on 25th of August 2020 by 5 p.m. through the digital age. 25th August, 5.30 p.m. Come on, let's all join the event and learn more about sustainable agriculture. See you on the 25th of August. Can you tell a friend? And don't forget to register it for this leading lecture. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much team uh, for that wonderful video. I think uh, the wishes are there from across the globe. And as I told, uh, I mean, IGEN is always uh, famous for creating a history in the history durations. Uh, we have started with the uh, Energetown, then we have moved to this Gendis Trancon, then to Eurocom. And the final much-awaited Nobel Laureate uh, lecture series is inaugurated today. So in this regard, I invite now Dr. S.S. Manta, Board of Governor Agent, former Chairman of AICT and Chancellor of KA University to declare this IGEN first Nobel Laureate lecture. Dr. S.S. Manta, please. Yeah. Sir Richard and other invitees, a warm good evening to you all. I am honored to be a part of the Institution of Green Engineers and I am very happy to be presenting today's program, an international event conducted by IGEM in association with KPR Institute of Engineering and Technology. It is indeed an honor and pleasure to introduce Sir Richard Robert, who will be delivering the first IGEM Nobel Laureate Lecture today. Sir Richard, 
was born on 6th September 43 and he was a British biochemist and molecular biologist. He was awarded the 93 Nobel Prize in Physiology Medicine with Philip Allen Shah for the discovery of introns in eukaryotic DNA and the mechanism of gene splicing. He currently works at New England Biolabs. He is a fellow of the Royal Society, which is an award granted by the judges of the Royal Society of London to individuals who have made a substantial contribution to the improvement of natural knowledge that includes mathematics, engineering, science, and medical science. His thesis involved phytochemical studies of neoflavonoids and isoflavonoids, Sir Robert's discovery of the alternative splicing of genes in particular has had a profound impact on the study and applications of molecular biology. It's a memorable occasion for me to welcome and listen to the lecture of such an eminent personality as Sir Richard. He's a great scholar, a researcher, a scientist, and an inspiration to all of us in India as he is around the world. Sustainable agriculture focuses on producing long-term crops and livestock while having minimal effects on the environment. It tries to find a good balance between the need for food production and the preservation of the ecological system within the environment. Sustainable agriculture has great importance and value in the Indian context. India is a global agricultural powerhouse. It's the world's largest producer of milk, pulses and spices and has the world's largest cattle herd as well as the largest area in the wheat, rice and cotton. Who else could have been a better person than Sir Richard to speak on such an important subject? As we celebrate the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi, it is in the spirit of things to understand his beliefs on agriculture. He said that the land should not belong to an individual or to the state and that a farmer should have an amount of land with which he could subsist his daily earnings honestly and live a life of dignity. He firmly believed that the agriculture we practice should be organic. The lecture I'm sure will provide several technological insights not only on sustainable agriculture but also for a long term ecological sustenance. I wish this event all the success. Over to you sir Richard. Okay well thank you very much. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen with you. Okay, so I think we're here. So what I want to do today is to talk to you about GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Um, I think the term GMO is a little misleading, but nevertheless has become very used, very much used um, in the public eye. GMOs were something that was originally discovered, how to make them, um, quite a time ago, back in Belgium. Uh, the person who did it is shown on the next slide. Um, on the right is Mark Van Montague. On the left, Mark plus Jeff Schell. And then at the bottom, Mary Del Chilton. And what they discovered was that there was a natural process that took place in which DNA could be transferred from a bacterium to a plant. This was something that the bacterium did for its own good, but Mark and Jeff and Mary Dell realized that this was also something that we could do to improve plants. And that led to a modern discovery um, that it was possible to actually do plant breeding in a much more precise and a much more measured way than had ever been done previously by traditional means. Mm -hmm. I went to a meeting in Belgium 
to celebrate Mark's 80th birthday. And I spent a day listening to scientists, plant scientists, in Europe, talking about how difficult it was to do plant research in Europe. And this was because of the anti-GMO people, in particular because of Greenpeace and their allies who were opposed to GMOs. Now I want to talk to you during the course of this talk about why that opposition arose and also to give you some insights into it. However, at the end of the meeting, I was struck by the thought that when you think about the people who go to bed hungry every night, more than 800 million of them, food is their medicine. And I have been invited, I have been invited, hey, this is, I'm sorry, let me back on this. Can you stop that? I have been invited the following day the following to day in the European Commission. Mr. Wilson, please, Mr. Wilson, please mute your phone. Yes, there, there is a problem here. There, there is a problem here. Because I keep hearing myself. Because I keep hearing myself. So I have been invited the following day to talk to the European Commission about the future of medicine. And after listening to what was going on with this meeting, I decided that instead of talking about vaccines and all of the other advances in medicine that had been made, I was going to talk about the fact that food is medicine for those people who go to bed hungry. I got such a good response from the European Commission, people I spoke to at the time, and I decided that perhaps I could mobilize the Nobel laureates to call for science honesty about GMOs and to stop the Green parties from keep scaring everybody by pretending that GMO foods must be dangerous and therefore should be banned. This was conceived in 2013, but it was launched formally some four years ago in 2016. At the moment, we have 155 Nobel laureates supporting this. And I rather like this cartoon in which we look at the difference between the developed countries and their approach to GMO technology and the developing countries where they really need better food. In the developed countries, they have so much food, they have choice, they can decide what they want to eat. But in the developing countries, they just want food to keep people alive. Now, food means agriculture. Whereas in many parts of the world that have developed, the source of food for almost everybody is the local supermarket. <coughs> Most of them don't grow a lot of their own food, but in the developing countries, they grow their own food. But even so, in cities, we need agriculture, we need big agriculture, we need big farms to grow the food that the people in the cities can eat. And what has happened is that in the developing world, in the developed world, rather, the big agribusiness spent a huge amount of money using traditional methods to improve the quality of crops. But in the developing world, the same resources were not available. And so the developing world, the smallholder farmers, are still using plants and methods of eating plants that were developed many, many years ago. They have not seen the benefit of improved agriculture, improvement in crop breeding. And in the 1980s, when Mark Van Montague and co. came along, we learned how to be precise, how to make crops, how to improve them in ways that were much better than the traditional approaches. If you look at what happened with corn as a good example, on the left-hand side, 
the wild ancestor, Teosinte, grew naturally in Central America. Slowly it was domesticated, people started to grow their own to find better breeds, and eventually we end up with the corn on the right hand side that is a hybrid that has much, much better productivity in terms of the number of grains per plant. This has been a natural evolution, if you like. It's one in which plant breeders have just crossed plants to make the one we see on the right. The way this is done is shown here. This is the only vaguely scientific slide I'm going to show you. On the left is conventional breeding, where we take one plant that is growing, that we use all the time, we call it a leaf variety, it's the thing we grow at the moment. On the right is a second plant, just to the right of it, the one with the yellow and blue um, circles on it. This is a new plant, a, a plant that will breed with the old one, but it has a trait that we want. Maybe it produces bigger corn cobs, maybe it grows taller, maybe it is more drag resistant. And we can cross those two plants, their DNA gets mixed up, and they produce what is shown here as the first hybrid. This is a mix, 50% of the gene from one plant, 50 from another. We select that hybrid that has the trait we want, the one with the blue gene in it. And then we cross that back to the original elite variety, selecting each time for the hybrid that has the blue gene in it. And we keep doing this until we essentially have transferred just the blue gene plus a few others into the original variety. And now the original variety has the improved trait. If that doesn't work, we use mutagene mutagenesis, chemical mutagenesis or radiation, in order to try to produce the varieties we want. This is all considered very safe according to Greenpeace, because we have doing it for so long. Now on the right hand side is the new GMO approach. I call it precision breeding. Following the natural way in which agrobacterium transfers genes into plants, it has a small piece of DNA called a plasmid that has on it genes that the bacterium is able to transfer into the plant. And Mark and Jeff realized that if they, instead of taking the gene that the bacteria wanted to move, they took the gene that they wanted to move, but here was an alternative way of achieving very rapidly what took a long time by conventional breeding. They could precisely introduce this one or two new genes into a plant that they desired. Greenpeace decided that this is dangerous. Now I want to give you an example of just what this is in terms that are perhaps a little easier to understand. Let's say that I want to move a GPS system from my old car into my new one. Do I take the two cars apart, mix up everything, and then select the one that has the GPS, ignoring whatever else it might have picked up. No, I think what I do is I take the GPS from one car, unplug it, and plug it into the new one. This is precision breeding. This is what precision breeding is all about. What if I were to take the GPS from an airplane, something totally different from a car, and put it into the car? Does this mean that the new car is going to fly? Well, no, of course not. There are many other things associated with flying. However, if you listen to the anti-GLMO activists, they will try to convince you that this new car is going to fly. And we have to realize that genetic modification refers to a method, a way in which you do something. But what's important is the product not the way in which you did it. And this is just as true for traditional breeding. If you worry about GMOs, you should equally worry, if not more so, about traditionally bred plants. 
So we have to remember, plants can't run away from predators. So how do they protect themselves? Well, the answer is pesticides. Plants produce pesticides to stop pests from growing on them. One of the common pesticides found in plants is methoxysorolin. If we look here at a number of very common plants that we eat all the time, you'll see that quite a few of them has a lot of methoxysorolin in them. And interestingly, although we eat a lot of celery, this carcinogen, this pesticide, methoxysorolin, doesn't cause us any problems because our bodies have learned how to deal with it. However, it used to be that when people were cutting celery and making little celery stalks in order to put into supermarket packages, they were getting a lot of celery juice on their hands. And this caused a contact dermatitis and in some cases, skin cancer because of the sorrowing. And so if celery were in fact a GMO, you would not be allowed to grow it or eat it at the moment. It would be considered too dangerous. But it's not. When you look at celery and you really take a hard look at what is there, the sorrowing is not a problem. Our body knows how to deal with it. Now, we know that in the developing countries, in Africa, in South America, in Asia, you need crops that produce higher yields. You need the products of precision breeding. You need to be able to improve the crops. You're not going to do it by traditional breeding because there's not the money to do that. Europe, on the other hand, doesn't need that. They already have all the food they need. So why wouldn't Europe endorse the GMO approach to making better crops, knowing that it could help the developing countries? Well, could it be politics or money or both? And I think the answer is both. Europeans didn't want US companies to control their food. So how do you prevent that? Well, you ban the US agribusinesses like Monsanto. Ah, but not so fast. The farmers buy their seeds from them. And so instead, the Green parties realized here was the opportunity to improve their outreach and to raise more money. They were opposed to Monsanto. And so when Monsanto first tried to bring GMOs into Europe, Greenpeace persuaded the politicians that they should stop GMOs. They should ban any plants with GMOs. The best of this was it had no economic consequence for Europe. And so how do you persuade people to ban something? Well, you tell them that they're dangerous. And so Greenpeace and their allies spent a great deal of time and money and advertising stopping what was going on. The tragic consequence of this is that they couldn't pretend that GMOs were dangerous for Europe, but were okay for the developing countries. And so what did they do? They started a, a, really a missionary movement almost to go to the developing countries and try to stop them too from making GMOs and growing GMOs. Again, it looks as though Europe is once again trying to instill its values on Africa and on the developing world. But I want to talk about a few case studies, about some things that we know GMOs can help. And the first one I want to talk about is something called golden rice. Vitamin A deficiency, we know, is a big problem in the developing countries, something like two million people die every year because of the consequences of vitamin A deficiency. In particular, it is a big problem for young children who don't get enough vitamin A. Now our bodies make vitamin A, but they make it from beta carotene. And so Peter Jennings in 1984 had this idea. What if you could take rice and persuade it to make beta-carotene 
and put it in the grain of the rice. In this way, one could improve the availability of beta carotene, which is missing from many of the traditional foods that are eaten in developing countries, but they eat a lot of rice. And so the thought was if you could bring this gene for beta carotene into rice, you could then help with vitamin A deficiency. This was brought to fruition by two scientists in Europe, Ingo Petrakis in Zurich and Peter Bayer at the University of Freiburg in Germany. It became a reality in February of 1999, that's 21 years ago. Had it not been a GMO, it could have been in the field within two to five years and commercial production would soon follow. But it's a GMO. And it had the problem, not only was it a GMO, but it also looked as though it was a GMO producing a pharmaceutical that could save people. And I think Greenpeace got rather worried about this. And they were concerned that because it had pharmaceutical qualities, it might get approved rather quickly. And so they did everything they could to stop it. The reason that pharmaceuticals um, could be a problem is best illustrated by the case of insulin. You know, diabetics take human insulin to help solve their diabetic problems. Where do you think human insulin comes from? Does it come from humans? Well, no. Human insulin is a, comes from a GMO. It comes from a yeast into which the gene for human insulin has been inserted and now it grows and produces human insulin. No one complains about that. I've never heard Greenpeace mention that this is a problem, even though it's a GMO. However, they saw that because golden rice might produce beta carotene, which could solve vitamin A deficiency, it could be sold to the consumers as a pharmaceutical. And so they went out of their way to do everything they could to stop it. They even produced this little brochure, which they call Golden Illusion. They claim it's taken so long to produce it that it can't possibly work. They failed to tell you that it was they who had done everything possible to block its development and to slow it down. Since 2005, millions of children have died or suffered because of vitamin A deficiency. What I want to know is how many have to die before we begin to consider that this is a crime against humanity. I hope not too many more. Now another problem that can be solved by GMOs concerns bananas. Bananas provide something like one third of the calories in sub-Saharan Africa. In particular, in Uganda, bananas are a very important crop. But they're very subject to diseases, one of which is xanthomonas wilt. And there are no natural varieties of, xanth of bananas that are resistant to xanthomonas wilt. And so, as soon as it gets into the fields, the plants die and that land cannot be used again to grow bananas. However, sweet peppers, which are abundant in sub-Saharan Africa, are completely resistant to Xanthomonas campestris, which causes Xanthomonas wilt. It's now, thanks to scientific research, that there are two genes in sweet peppers that mediate this resistance. And using GMO or precision techniques, these genes have been transferred to banana and the bananas are now growing quite successfully, but only in field trials because as yet there is no permission from the parliament and government in Uganda to make these commercially available. The farmers want them. The farmers have seen them growing in these field trials. They desperately want them but the politicians are blocking action 
And why? Because the anti-GMO activists have been very powerful in stopping the president from signing the bill. Another problem in Kenya, Uganda, and many other places is cassava. Cassava is not something that's eaten widely in the developing countries, and so little effort has been made to improve it. However, in 2020, scientists in Kenya and Uganda engineered a variety of cassava that was resistant to brown streak disease, which causes the cassavas to look rather nasty, as shown in the picture on the left. This is interesting because this work was completely done by scientists in Africa. No outside influence at all. Again, this is going to have to wait for approval, which it seems it likely will get in Kenya, but maybe more slowly obtained in Uganda. Again, the politicians, thanks to anti-GMO activists, are stopping this important development. Poor army worm is something else that's a big problem in many countries in southern Africa. This was actually a worm that caused problems in the south of the US many, many years ago. And somebody, and somebody we, have this problem we have this problem again. Someone, I think, Someone. needs to mute their microphone, probably. What happens is in the southern part of the US, this army worm was causing major problems. The plant breeders found a way to overcome it, and they did it by introducing a gene from a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, the BT gene, that will kill the fall army worm. And so instead of needing to spray the plants with pesticides, including BT, the four army worm was defeated because the plants now make their own. This same breed of corn is widely grown in the southern part of the US. It's Africa and has been successful in really stopping the fall army worm. But Zimbabwe, Zambia, Namibia, Malawi, they're all non-GMO countries. They're all countries where the politicians were gotten to by the anti-GMO movement. And they banned it. They won't allow this to be grown, even though people are eating it widely around the world. They still think it's dangerous. And so here is a case where, thanks to biotechnology, thanks to GMOs, a problem can be solved is the politicians that are stopping it. Zimbabwe has now recently decided that maybe it will be okay to grow BT corn in Zimbabwe because they are facing major famines. In Bangladesh, which is actually one of the more forward-looking of the developing countries, they had a big problem with eggplants, brinjal, they call it. Their eggplants were being devastated by a bug that was killed by Bt. The Bt gene was transferred into eggplants, and now in Bangladesh they grow more eggplants than they can eat. Interestingly, farmers in India who live in the neighboring parts of the country to Bangladesh saw what was happening in Bangladesh. They saw that their own eggplants were being devastated by insects. And so many of them went over the border, got the seeds and started growing their own BT eggplants. This is something that really we need to do more of because this is banned in India. India does not allow GT crops to be grown with the exception of BT cotton. We need to make sure that the government in India becomes educated scientifically so that the advances possible with GMO solutions can be brought to the farmers and to the people. Another interesting case happened in Hawaii. Hawaiian papayas were being devastated by a ring spot virus many years ago. 
In the 1990s, this was a big problem with half the crop being killed. In 1998, Dennis Gonsalves at the University of Hawaii developed a transgenic fruit called rainbow papaya, which is resistant to the virus. This is a GMO papaya. And now, almost 80% of the crop in Hawaii is genetically engineered and is being eaten in the USA. The USA, which has been insisting on labeling things that contain GMOs, are eating GMO papaya uh, without any labeling and without any problems. Something interesting happened. The politicians in Hawaii decided that it would be good in order to label all crops that were produced from GMOs. This is something that has taken off in the mainland of the US and you see labels GMO all over the foods these days. However, the papaya farmers were very concerned about this. They said, if you do that, no one's going to buy our papayas. And so what did they do? They called upon the parliament and said, you cannot do this. We cannot support this GMO labeling bill. But the anti-GMO activists and the organic farmers, among others, were keen on getting everything labeled as containing GMOs. And so what was the solution? Well, the solution was the politicians said, we will pretend that rainbow papaya is not a GMO because it was done so long ago and everybody's eating it. Um, it's only newly developed GMOs that will need to be labeled. In Thailand, it has exactly this same problem with a ring spot virus. The solution is bad. They're not allowed to grow GMO papayas. However, the farmers there, seeing their crops destroyed, went across the border and got a similar, a similar papaya, something also that had been developed as a transgenic papaya, and they started growing them in Thailand. And so now a lot of the papayas grown in Thailand are GMO papayas, even though they're banned. And I think this illustrates something very important. Farmers have to feed their families, they have to feed the population. Just because we have GMO activists arguing against improving crops, because that plays well in Europe, they really have to stop doing this in the developing world, and the farmers realize this. The farmers are smart. They're going to grow whatever produces the best yield. They're not going to listen to the anti-GMO activists. We have to remember that food choice is very much a luxury of the developed world. If you don't want to eat foods derived by GM techniques, then don't. It's your choice. No one's going to make you. But please, please, don't pretend that such foods are dangerous. If anything, they are probably safer than traditional foods. Because of the traditional method of breeding, in addition to bringing in genes that you want, you bring in a lot of additional genes and you don't know what they do. For developed countries, food is not a problem. You don't see a lot of thin Europeans walking around. But we must never forget the consequences of our actions for the developing countries. Especially today, when news of what is happening in Europe or the US or Japan travels very quickly over the internet, as soon as we start saying things that are intended for local consumption in Europe, like this anti-GMO method, that word gets around the world. And so you can't pretend that things that you say that are specific for a particular country are not going to have an impact elsewhere. And the bottom line, I think, is well illustrated by this current coronavirus pandemic, is that we need a lot more science in politics. We need the politicians to listen to the scientists. And along the way, it might be nice if we had a little less politics in science. Politicians really must listen to the scientists they fund. 
Otherwise, why do they funding? What is the point in funding science and then not listening to what's going on? Then we have to stop supporting the ideas that foods produced by precision breeding methods must be inherently more dangerous than traditional methods. When the science shows very clearly they are not hot. The science shows clearly that they are as safe as traditionally bred foods. Since we started growing foods, growing plants using GMO methods, there has not been one single incident of a problem. Not one. Surely, if these approaches are so dangerous, we would have seen many problems by now. But we haven't. We've not seen one. And I think it's important that civil society plays its role too. The major religious leaders should speak out. We have been trying to convince the Pope that he should make a method, should make a statement about this for all of the Catholics. Groups like, groups like the Rotary Clubs, which on the whole are very pro-GMO, they must speak out, they must talk a lot more about this. Influential celebrities should speak out. Football players in Africa have a lot of credentials. They should speak out in favor of GMOs. And in particular, I think the media, television, newspapers need to make sure that they present science facts and not science fiction. They shouldn't pretend that GMOs are dangerous when there is no evidence to that effect. If they're going to talk about people who are opposed to GMOs, they should do it in context and point out why these people are opposed um, and really stick to the facts. If the science does not support being anti-GMOs, it should not be reported that it does. The best thing that's come out of the Catholic Church on this issue so far is this letter it was sent to the bishops on the bread and wine for the Eucharist. You know, a, a very important ceremony that takes place in the Roman Catholic Church is the eating of bread, sharing of bread and wine, and supposedly the lifeblood of Christ. The congregation that wrote what is appropriate for the bread and wine that is served at Eucharist say that Eucharistic matter, that is bread or wine made with genetically modified organisms, can be considered valid matter for this. It's okay to eat it if it's genetically modified. Interestingly, gluten-free bread apparently doesn't work for this. But this is a very positive statement, that it's the only one that's come out so far from the Vatican. Now we do have a number of people who have converted. And an interesting one is Patrick Moore, shown on the top left. He was the president of Greenpeace, and he was the one who came up with the idea that by telling everybody GMOs were dangerous, that they could raise money for Greenpeace. In fact, Greenpeace has an enormous budget, some three to five hundred million euros every year just in Europe. The reason they've been so successful at fundraising is because of their anti-GMO stance. Patrick Moore, some years ago now, changed his mind completely and said, no, GMOs are safe. Stephen Tinsdale, former UK executive director of Greenpeace, unfortunately no longer with us, but he was very anti-GMO and then switched completely and adopted a pro-GMO position. Mark Linus, who's written extensively about this, was very anti-GMO. He was even going out burning crops in fields. And he listened to the science and now is very much in favor of GMOs. And a very important person is Mohamed Nassir. He was leader of the Peasants Farmers Association in Ghana very anti-GMO, he convinced a lot of farmers to be that way, but he took some time off, studied the facts, learned about the science, and now he is very pro-GMO and is trying to convince farmers that they should be. These are the voices 
that we need to hear more from. The people who have actually looked at the science and have been convinced by what they've learned. I'd like to leave with this slide, which I call Have a Heart. Non-GMO is a Western indulgence of the rich. On the left, you see a typical dinner table at a restaurant in Paris. No shortage of food, no shortage of good food. But on the right, you see poor children in Africa who don't get enough to eat. They don't ask, will I eat today? Sorry, they ask, what will I eat today? Not, what will I eat today? They just want food. Food is medicine for them. They need the products of GMOs. For people who want to study and look at this a little more, there's a very good movie called Feed Evolution um, that is available on Hulu. It may be available elsewhere. And there is a book about golden rice by Ed Regis that details the history of golden rice. Golden rice is almost approved in Bangladesh, almost approved in the Philippines, and we hope soon that it will get final approval there. And finally, at the bottom, is a link to a website, the Nobel Laureate's website, supportprecisionagriculture.org. You can see the names of all of the laureates who joined this campaign, and there is an opportunity for you to sign up and join it yourself. I would encourage you to do so. And there is a lot of additional information there about GMOs, about the movement, and about how you can help convince your friends, your fellows, your colleagues, your family, that GMOs are safe, that we need more, and that they offer a wonderful solution to sustainable agriculture in the developing world. At that point, I'll stop. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, sir. It's really an eye-opening uh, session from you. Uh, really, uh, I mean, it's just not me, uh, in addition to the participants, those who have joined directly in Google Meet. The YouTube participants have really enjoyed the sessions. Uh, the comments which is flowing uh, in the uh, YouTube chat box uh, says that uh, what I'm saying is true. Uh, so thanks a lot for all the participants, those who are watching YouTube. Uh, kindly subscribe the channel and post all your questions so that I'm consolidating all the questions and I'm taking the questions to our Nobel laureate, Sir Richard. Uh, so this time I hope to appreciate the contribution from the IGN and IGN members along with the academic partner KPRAT. Without them, this uh, such a wonderful event may not be possible. So before uh, taking few questions, uh, I invite now the uh, KPR team as an academic partners to uh, I mean, for, say, uh, play a small video to describe uh, them. Can you just have a small video so that I can consolidate the questions in between and I can post the to Sir Richard? Yes, please. Yes, please. KPR Institute of Engineering and Technology. We have the facilities like Industry Institute Partnership Cell, Office of International Relations, Office of Alumni Relations, Center for Innovation, Incubation and Entrepreneurship Development, Center for Research and Development to cater the needs of the students.
thank you thank you so much uh, KPR IT team for that wonderful video that helped me to consolidate few questions quickly yes uh, sir richard uh, so probably one word which really uh, means what is it motivated just not me the entire audience in the youtube is uh, we need more science in politics and less politics in science and it is just not about the politics and uh, i mean so to say even the peoples if you take countries like india we have about 130 crore peoples i mean so to say it is easy for uh, probably to convince the peoples with the technical background but uh, when you put some pilot of research and you find something new it is really difficult uh, to i mean so to say prove that what is genetically modified something is uh, i mean so to say quite uh, great uh, to across the nation. So, how do you see the challenges across the globe? Well, I think the biggest single problem is one of education. We need to make sure that when children go to school, that they're really educated in science, they're taught, not deep science, but they're taught in a way that will enable them to think logically, to understand what science is all about, and to be spoken to in language that they really can understand. I, I was especially struck not too long ago, I gave a talk to some young children, 12, 13 years old, about GMOs. And they all wrote back to me, and they'd been told they had to. And many of them said the following, that this was the first time that they'd been spoken to as though they were adults. Um, teachers tend to treat children as though they're lesser beings in some way. They often don't treat them as though they're adults and capable of understanding. But the very best letter I got back was from a young girl who wrote and said she'd gone home and talked to her parents and told them what I told them in class and repeated everything. And she said her parents, who had been anti-GMOs before she spoke to them, were now pro-GMO. And so I think young people really can be the key here. Um, young people, when they are known or recognized to be smart, can convince parents and grandparents and other family members that what is being said by the scientists, and um, if spoken to properly and expressed properly by the children, can have a huge impact on a society. And so I think we need to pay a lot more attention to educating children. And we also need to teach scientists how to talk to the general public. Because I think this is something else we often, as scientists, don't do as well as we might. And I would make it a, a prerequisite in any university course, actually even in high school courses, that people are taught, scientists are taught, how to speak to the public in language they understand. Yeah, that is really an interesting answer. Yeah, I mean, uh, almost all the students in India are studying science as a mandatory subject up to at least uh, 10. Yeah, thanks for that input, uh, Richard. There is another... Yeah, are they being taught to express and teach that science to the general public? This, this is what is key. We, we, we shouldn't just talk to ourselves, we've got to talk to the general public. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, thanks uh, uh, for that answer, Richard. And uh, there is an interesting question uh, uh, from Ramalingam Subrai in YouTube. Uh, the concern with the GMO is uh, what if method flawed and uh, we get undesirable consequences uh, maybe after a few years. So that's always a, I mean, sort of a mindset uh, almost across uh, across the uh, country which we have. Like, I mean, so to say, even if it is good for the first few years, but I mean, so to say, if something goes wrong, probably the years or if the impact is uh, understood after a few years or a few decades. Well, you know, if we take a look at traditional breeding, which is the way we've always done this, have there been no accidents there? Well, no, there have been plenty of accidents. There have been plenty of problems with plants that have been bred by traditional methods. With GMOs, we have 30 years of experience so far, not a problem. But, you know, life is not risk-free. If you don't want to take any chances whatsoever, you will never leave your house. You'll never try to cross a road. You'll never look at another smartphone. Are you aware of what smartphones do to the macula in your eyes? The blue light is destroying the macula. 
macular degeneration is becoming a young people's problem now because looking at cell phones. And so if you're not prepared to take any risks, then you're probably not, not, you shouldn't live on this earth. Life is full of risks. I think the risks with GMOs are so low. And if there is one, then we will deal with it. But so far, after 30 years, there have been no problems. Do we have to wait 100 years before we decide they're safe? 500 years? How long is long enough? Personally, I would prefer to see people eat and not die because they have enough food, um, whether it's from GMO or whether it's from traditional methods. When you have a technology for which there is no evidence of danger, why manufacture it? Yeah, I think uh, your uh, last but one slide has talked about uh, will I eat today is most important question than what exactly. I eat. So I that's think right. that, that, that's perfectly answered that question. That thanks, Richard. I think you have beautifully put up. And I think I mean, say one more interesting fact. Like uh, means even though you are a Nobel laureate, you have uh, really put up the things so simple. Even, uh, I mean, so to say, adult uh, at the age of uh, 15, um, I mean, those who have basic knowledge on science is to understand the subject. But unfortunately, I feel uh, that's missing across the globe. That's also a real reason why, uh, I mean, so to say, uh, means people say have not really understood this uh, GMO. And I mean, so say, what are the efforts which you are taking so that all your research, not only means, so to say, developing the great products, but also this is getting convinced by the common publics, uh, especially in the countries like India. So, I'm not sure what the question is. Yeah, question is like, uh, apart from your research, what are the other additional activities which you are taking, or your, uh, means what to say, progress, uh, which you are working on to convince the peoples and the policy makers? Well, so I talk at conferences like this, I talk to policy makers, my research is not involved with GMOs, it's not involved with plants, I work on bacteria. So everything I do is to try to bring the stature of the Nobel laureates to bear when I talk to politicians. So one of the things I discovered after I won the Nobel Prize is that people suddenly started listening to what I had to say and sometimes even acted on it. And so I've really gone out of my way to try to meet with politicians, to politicians and the leaders to make a change. But sometimes change comes from people. If the Roman Catholic Church took a strong stance on GMOs, I think that could have a big effect. If the Rotary Clubs could do it. So I'm trying to get as many people as possible on board to support the idea that GMOs are not dangerous. What I'd really like to do is to convince Greenpeace that this is an area that they've made a mistake on. They do a lot of good stuff. Greenpeace has done a lot of good stuff to protect the environment. But this is an issue they got wrong. And when you get something wrong, you should admit it and get on with doing all the good stuff you can do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Richard. I think that's really a beautiful uh, answer. I think there are quite a lot of questions which are flooding in the YouTube is almost similar to what I have asked. So I have uh, consolidated quite a lot of questions. Uh, maybe one interesting question from Mr. Makesh. When Golden Rice is excellent contributor of uh, vitamin A, uh, why is it not available for a consumption? So you have talked about this uh, uh, Golden Rice. Uh, What's the commercial availability in the market? Okay, well it's not. And the reason that it's not is because of political action. So in the Philippines, it's at the very last stage of being approved. So all the safety trials have been done, everything has been done. There is just one further step that the government needs to take in order to grant approval for growth. The same is true in Bangladesh. And we're hoping but before the end of this year, um, one of these two countries will get started. And I think once it gets started, then it's going to be a great easier to get other countries to agree. Many countries have said that um, they would import it, that they'd be happy to take it. They think it's safe. They want to eat it. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and several others. But the production of it is still not allowed in Bangladesh and Philippines which is crazy because this is something that really need. 
yeah. Thank you so much for clarifying that because I have also the same doubt which is came in YouTube as well. So maybe uh, means before uh, I'm going for means one more interesting question like uh, uh, countries like India means we have uh, means what say the most of the population lies at the age from probably 15 to 30 where the young dynamic people uh, etc. So means what's the role this young generation has to play? Uh, to take this forward and prove, I uh, mean, provide the food for the entire world. I uh, mean, so as yes, you are told, uh, the numbers of people, those who are going to bed without uh, dinner in the night. So, I mean, so say, what's the role uh, which you feel uh, it is essential for these young people's uh, countries like India? I means this young generation is the power of the entire nation. Well, I think you have to recognize that no matter where you live, it is the young people that are the future. And so one needs to make sure that they get educated about what is going on. Because I think one of the things that has become clear over the centuries is that when young people get together, realize that the old people are misbehaving, they can join together and can make them change. I think the Vietnam War was a very good example in the US where it was the young people who saw the futility, the idiocy of the Vietnam War who stopped it. And so this idea of enabling young people to get together, to have their views made known, is a very, very strong one. This lady, Greta Thunberg, from Sweden, who has been anti, trying to stop climate change, doing everything she can, has a huge following of young people. And so if you can find a few articulate young people, they can change, they can bring people together. And in general, young people are good because they don't fear things as much as we do. They, as we get older, we tend to get conservative. We tend to be afraid of all sorts of things. Young people have no fear. They don't think, this is why they go to war, you know? They don't think they can be killed. You and I, and our elderly peers would never go to war because we know we're likely to get killed. Young people, they do it. They have no fear. And we should find a way to mobilize this and to get it to the politicians. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sir Richard, for answering that beautiful question. And uh, means what is it? This event was basically national, but uh, thanks to this Alata TV that becomes international, so I can have quite a lot of questions, but I thought of inviting Anya Sahu uh, to take a few more questions. Anya, please. Yes, greetings everyone. Uh, it's an honor for us to be present today here as a reporter of Alatra International Internet TV Television and volunteer with the Creative Society Project. And I would like to give a word to Alexander Masni from Germany. He is bio... Uh, He's working in the area of biochemistry, and he would like to ask some also question. Please, Alexander. Hello. Uh, hope you hear me. I see you. I see you all. That's nice. <laughs> um, first, I would like to thank you for a uh, really interesting lecture, the expanding the knowledge of, uh, the, direct, of the lecture that I have uh, back here in the AX. And um, my question is uh, more related uh, to the Creative Society project. So uh, you said in the lecture that truth, that true scientific information is not always delivered to the wider, uh, wider audience. And therefore, a lot of people suffer from receiving information or uh, lack of information. In your opinion, uh, what are the main conditions that should be created in the society in different spheres, not only like here in this example, like in agri agriculture, but in general, to overcome this uh, situation, to change it, and uh, uh, to create a society where human life will be the highest value and will be that our society will be human oriented? Well, I think I, I have several answers to that. One is that. We have become a very money-oriented society. And I think the sooner we get away from that and realize that making as much money as possible by whatever means possible is not a good aim for human beings, that would be a good thing. 
And unfortunately, in many of the developed countries, and even now in the developing countries, making money seems to be a thing that drives everything that people do, and I think we have to find a way to stop that. I think also we need to be a little more careful about the use of social media, in which a great deal of misinformation um, gets transmitted via social media. And if there was some way to do some fact-checking on everything that went through social media, that would be very good. Um, there are a number of sites where you can actually find out what is true and what isn't true. And we need to make those more widely available and perhaps find ways in which artificial intelligence can be used to monitor social traffic on the internet and also to connect and find out when people are not, not telling the truth. You know, the, there is a, a, a big movement in the U.S. that follows President Trump to find out how many times he lies every day. And I mean, the numbers are just overwhelming. But I think the same is true of politicians generally in many countries, that they are much more interested in the message and getting across something that looks good on television than sticking to the truth. And we need to stop this and find better ways to stop it. I, I don't have the perfect answer as to how we should do that, but I think if we shut down social media, that might help a great deal. Now, I have to go in one minute uh, because I have another conference that I'm participating in in South Africa. And so what I would suggest is that anybody who has questions, if you send them to some central collecting point, and you can work out among yourselves where that should be, and then that can be consolidated into a small set of questions, email me and I will answer them that way, and then you can disseminate all the answers. Is that yeah, okay? Yeah, that, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for okay. time, value of your time, and uh, thanks a lot for your great time which you have spent. I strongly believe it is not only technically educate our young minds, uh, but also this gives uh, I mean, some awareness about uh, I mean, GMOs, and of course also this motivates the students and uh, probably most of the academicians uh, to work towards the, the I mean, sort of say Nobel laureate. Thank you, thank you so much. I don't have really moments to express my sincere thanks on behalf of IGN and KPR AG, our academic partner. We thank you, thank you, thanks a lot for your presence and your time and effort. Uh, thank you so much, Richard. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Bye. <laughs> yes. Uh, so. I think that's the, an amazing lecture. Like uh, means we are watching a 2020 match and uh, flooded with quite a lot of sixes and boundaries. Yeah, thank you so much, Richard, sir, for your uh, beautiful presentation along with the question and answers. Yes, I think uh, there are huge number of questions which are flooding in uh, YouTube chat box, and we have also received quite a lot of questions in the uh, means along with the registration as well. And I believe our international. Uh, Television partner, Alantra TV, also had quite a lot of questions which is there in their mind. And first, that has to go. Any consolidate all these questions and we will uh, we'll, uh, take this question to start, but the questions which are needed. I once again thank all the participants, those who are in uh, YouTube stream, because I mean, so say, though there are quite a lot of technical clinches at the beginning, I mean, so say, people has identified some. Uh, Technology come back to your uh, our channel, right? That's the real reason why we have asked everyone to subscribe our channel. Yeah. Thanks for the few students. Thank you. Thanks a lot for all the participants. Those who are not really subscribed, really subscribe that channel and uh, stay connected. There are quite a lot of other technical events which are coming up. Uh, so now means we are moving to another interesting part of uh, the event. And it's, uh, as a part of this IGN. Uh, Nobel Laureate Lecture Series. We have conducted quite a lot of competitions, uh, and we uh, say I believe about thousand uh, registrations for a competition alone from different sectors. In this regard, now I invite uh, Dr. Enam Jyoti Swaroopan, organizing the IGN NLL competition, and Dr. G. R. Sudhasri, organizing coordinator for this IGN Nobel Laureate Lecture competition. Along with their team and our engineer, uh, Sandil Kumar 
for declaring the winners of the various competitions which has held as a part of this IGN Nobel Laureate Lectures. Competition team, the session is yours now. Thank you, Sarosa. Good evening, all. The IG Nobel Laureate Lecture Series Multifold International Competitions was held for all ages, starting with pre KG to 12 standard students, to college students, of all streams, academicians, industrialists, and retired persons, homemakers, and all kinds of people. We thank all the 2,000 registered participants of these competitions. The competitions announced were based on two themes. One was about research, Sir Richard John Roberts' research work or about his biography, and the other theme was on sustainable agriculture. We announced the competitions on four different categories. They are artistic challenge for school students of the new grades, where they were asked to portray their ideas and imagination on any medium as a painting. The topic given was sustainable agriculture. They were asked to do oil paints, face painting, or pastel painting, murals, etc. And the second category was talent hand for college students of any streets, where they were asked to transcend their imagination about Sir Richard John Roberts, the Nobel laureate in physiology or medicine. They were allowed to ideate and telecast their ideas with video or just an audio as presentations or even as animations or role plays. Then we have the third category, creative pitch deck for all academicians and any industrialists. They were asked to exhibit their ideas in the form of posters or PowerPoint presentations on Nobel laureate Sir Richard John Roberts' research work or their innovative idea on sustainable agriculture in 2050. And then the last category was snap and share, where we thought we we'll asked all the general public, like retired persons and the homemakers, to share a selfie with their home plants and share two ideas of for sustainable agriculture towards 2050, because we care about our all our environmental activities. So all the entries were showcased live on YouTube on 23rd August and we got a overwhelming support for this sale, almost a 5.7k views. Now we feel this is the right time to announce the results. All the particip participants are eagerly waiting for the results. So now may I call upon the team heads of the competitions to announce the results. Can we have the team heads? Dear all, it's an uh, immense pleasure in welcoming you all for the competition where uh, the people are gathered together. More than uh, 2,000 entries we have received. Among us, team heads really put a lot of efforts in consolidating all the results in terms of how they really worked on. As per the words today that Robert Sir has inculcated in our mind, agriculture is not only for the particular age or particular gender. It's common to each and every one of us. On behalf of all these understanding, we have gathered a people starting from the age of two and it went up to the age of 70. So as uh, Ma'am was mentioning, we are congratulating all the winners and it doesn't mean that we have left our participants. Without them, nothing would have been a fruitful parameter to have this kind of interesting competitions starting from the age two to seven zero. Thank you. And now it's the time for us to announce the first competition, that is artistic challenge. You could see the young minds with the idea of agriculture. While uh, they are presenting, it's very, very eager for us to look at the young minds with the words of sustainable agriculture. 
That is the way it has been started from KG to second standard. The first winner is Mr. Geeta Singh, second Ms. Yes Nagaswati. And the next category is between year third to sixth standard. And the winner is Ms. V. S. Ananya. And the runner is D. Arun Draj. So, on the last category is between 7th to the 12th standard, the winner is Ms. N. Janani and the runner is Mr. Tanuj Gupta. And event is all about a talent and competition. As Mama has pointed out, it is for college level students. And the first winner is Mr. Anand Kumar Shukla and the second is Ms. Ms. Rakshita Madhu and the third competition is all about creative pitch deck is the winner is Bhungode Sambat and the runner is Ms. Prashantni and the last event is all about snap and share the winner is Ms. Ashwin Kaur and the runner is Mrs. Shruti S and here is the list of outstanding performance wherein we are really hard to neglect these people without providing at least a small a gratitude to them and the first thing we would like to announce is outstanding this has been really introduced at the last moment because of their active participation and you could see the list here for the different categories and for winners and runners we gratitude with them with a shield medal and signed by Dr. Richard Johnson Robert and the outstanding they will get the medal and the certificate all the participants are get the participation certificate so here is the first event with a list you could see the second one is all about talent and event with the outstanding performers the list is very big so we are not reading out all the names but don't worry we will be contacting you in person and delivering the shield and medal through the courier and the last one is all about the event. It's about the snap and share. Here also you could see the list of outstanding performance. And the last one is. And finally, with this person, all this has been happened. That is none other than our team coordinator, Dr. M. N. Jyoti Sharuban, founder, Ijin. Now I'd like to hand over the session to uh, Subhashti ma'am to take over. Thank you ma'am. Thank you sir. So we have selected one winner and one runner for each category and we couldn't avoid. So we have selected 10 outstanding contributions for this sake. So it's just a reminder message, the certificate, medal and issue for all the winners will be sent to Korea. It will take some time. Our team will be in touch with you regarding this sake. We again express our gratitude to our organizing head for IGN NLLS competitions, Dr. N. M. Jyoti Swarupan, for his constant support and guidance. In white, Engineer Sethendil Kumar, head partners of IGN, to congratulate our winners. Good evening to everyone. Today I have to conclude this uh, competition. For the, the sport forming has many benefits, battery energy, water management, optimist production, or that. The solar impulse foundation is also looking for that. Now, sustainable forming solutions also there. In the, the following competitions are also the competitions are declared, results also declared, artistic challenge, talent and competition, creative pitch deck, and snap and set. And I want to, first of all, I want to congratulate on behalf of Hygen, I congratulate the every person. It's a very very nice session. Thanks, thanks to everyone, every participant. So today is the right time to start the sustainable agriculture. This is our our Richard Sir giving the very good motivation speech about the agriculture side. It is a very good thing. So today we are going to start the agri sustainable agriculture and development to the country. So it gives more strength to the nation and the world. In this noble or lecture series, a lot of persons participated and present here very nice. Thanks to every participant. It is a memorable time to everyone for participating in the NLS competitions. So we are happy to announce that IGEN NLS team will very soon post a validatory function for all the participants of multiple competitions and to the winners. 
and certificates and awards. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So with that, we are concluding our uh, remarks for the competitions. We thank all the participants and everyone for making our event a very successful one. Thank you. Thank you. Selva, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarvati, madam, for that uh, uh, announcing the competition winners. I have only one final remarks for the competition people, those who have competed in the event and their name doesn't appear in the slide that they have thrown. I mean, what to say, I always strongly believe this. Uh, I means what to say, uh, you are the best judge for you. So the judges, those who have selected few people based on their judgment, you prove them wrong. You prove them wrong by means of winning a Nobel Prize. I believe that that uh, means essentially says, I uh, means your judgment is right. As simple as that. So I believe that's also a real reason why we are, uh, means what to say, conducting this Nobel Laureate Lecture Series. It should motivate the students from the college, from the schools from the people those who are working in the research or development to aim always bigger even i thought i mean what is a noble laureate lecture series is uh, next to impossible but i mean what is i am in the I means what is comparing that event so everything is possible so aim high and prove our judges are wrong if you prove that i mean i will be the happiest person in the world yeah with that i think i mean what is there are quite a lot of questions which came in uh, i think our uh, sir richard uh, so it's not available to take the questions. So in this regard, we have an Indian version of Nobel Laureate, Vasakam sir. I have to uh, really mean to say uh, proud of uh, him actually. I mean, I never personally know about him, but uh, it is at 11.55 in our uh, Englothon. Means we have invited him only in the morning 9 o'clock, but he even watching at even 11.55 in our one of the event. Uh, so I think I could say he's an Indian uh, version of our Nobel Laureate. So means what is, I will take few questions, uh, Vasakam sir, if you are available. Uh, sir, you can unmute yourself, sir. I have to take few questions. Uh, probably the questions also in Indian versions of the questions. Uh, probably that's the reason why I have not really posted the questions to Richard, sir, also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, sir, actually means what to say, uh, means what to say, you might have seen the difference. I mean, what to say, India is the country even the pre-event what we have conducted the speakers mostly talks about the uh, means sustainable green uh, agriculture etc so but i mean what say uh, our nobel prize uh, laureate has talked about the gmo so I means what say how do you see uh, which path the india has to take in the future because we are at the both the sides i mean what say one side he has shown the beautiful foods and other side the people with hunger but india is the country which sees both together so what's the way forward for india yeah, uh, you see, the Gregory Mandel, no, when he started the field of genetics, he was a person in the religious thing, you know, monastery. No, it was born in monastery. All this, uh, you know, hybrid plants and many other things. And in the dairy industry, we have extensive use of you know, veterinary medicine. It is already there. So, it only in the food chain only we are now talking. So this is one thing which will have to be proven, no? as he rightly said, uh, everything has side effect. Even normal taking food also may have side effect, that we can't say. So the, in fact, MJ University, we had a rice you know, mill owners. They sponsored a candidate for making our ordinary rice in South India like Basmati, you know, by small genetic change only. So that level is there. So, the people have ideas, but the thing is, the grassroots level, the problem has to be identified, and that is where Dr. Swaminathan and C. Sronin succeeded. You know, Mexican dwarf variety and our, uh, you know, Indian, so that uh, stoner uh, variety of the wheat, which was making the green revolution possible. So, that was the kind of thing, and uh, Swaminathan said in 1940s, genetics in uh, Holland. So, the, where they started and where they ended, you know, eliminating hunger and, you know, that shift to mouth to, you know, now we are exporting food also. So, that I think you will have to see. But you must see one important, the Anomaly University, I think somebody, I saw the names, because they were also financed in agriculture research. Some of the, you know, the, the Naivali waste, the after coal the oil is, you know, it is used, dignite is used. So, the micronutrients which are available in the uh, ash, 
players that is useful for plant growth. So like that, there are many people who are interested in doing such a good, uh, good work. That you will have to see. At the same time, we also see today this COVID vaccine, no? more than I don't know, 100 and odd companies are running the race. But how they will come out with something which is workable, whether it is one year from now or two years from now, you know, even WHO takes, two years it will take. So certain things take time, but I think we should be careful in selecting the right path. That is what I think. But I want to always give an example. You know, one PT Usha was found by India, yeah. you know, in the Kanu beach, Kanu area. She was actually running in the beach sand without any shoe or anything like that, no, of course, the sand. And after seeing her performing again that kind of condition, now one Nambia emerged as a coach. So the global arts are supposed to be mentoring this kind of people who may have talent and innate capability. That is what I think this series should do, successfully do it. Thank I you. hope that the competition which you are conceiving also should be beyond the textbook, beyond the journals, and beyond the research lab activity, or beyond that you have to think of problems. That is what I think the IGN has to generate such a category of problems as a competition challenge. You know? That is what you will have to see. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank, you. Thank you so much for your input, sir. I think it means what say. Uh, the people's outside the agent has a jealous on agent i have to say this actually really it means what say how these people are quite frequently doing marathon I means 12 hours even 13 hour events and bringing quite a lot of people and i have to appreciate two important people so one is uh, aram baskam sir and other one is the sake the sir it means what say their vision is uh, directing us and uh, we are uh, i mean so say at a speed of rocket i have to say yeah, yes, I think this next question to both of them, uh, both the Vasim sir as well as the Daud sir. Uh, sir, I mean, so to say, uh, I think this is a famous word uh, in India by one of our eminent person. I mean, so production by mass, mass production, right? I mean, so India need production by masses, India doesn't need mass production. So, I mean, so to say, how do you see, uh, I mean, so to say, India taking forward uh, from this uh, perspective, especially after this COVID-19? Uh, you see the rural area, the spread is still less. What you have found, no COVID or whatever, only transfer through some people who go from urban area. Already, whatever is the purity is there, already air or water and immunity because they are exposed to sun and also they are mostly in the field. So that kind of thing, once you are in a protected environment, your immunity is lost. I think that is why biotechnology people will understand that kind of thing. So the, once you lose your immunity to get it back, you know, whether it is a homeopathy or allopathy, it is immaterial. Because ultimately, the body mechanism has to be triggered. So a very small quantity of the homeopathy, you know, medicine is able to trigger the body immunity only. It is not a direct medicine. So whereas in allopathy, you give the dose for eliminating the full, you know, uh, virus or whatever you know, that load. So that is another way of doing it. So the and surgery is the worst bomb. You, know, you remove a usable part of the body. Whether it is animal or for the uh, human being, it is material. So this is where I think you will have to think of. But in agriculture, what I would say, the drip irrigation you know, is something which has to be done. And the borewells are 1000 feet and all, you know, in Kwanbuku district and all. I come from that area. So I know also every drop of water counts and it is also saline so the, all plants can be grown in the soil which is available there so sometimes the, you have to choose the maize may come in one place or some other sugar cane in another but the uh, what i would say when i go to tanju belt actually tears come in my eyes because the water is so much is getting wasted for growing the rice crop you know the rice is a water guzzler, sugarcane is still worse. So we also have to find some way of you know water management and also the preserving the soil's uh, fertility, natural fertility. That is very very important. So in that we will have to see how they will be organizing. But uh, last week I some Abhuta campus you know some program on agriculture engineering similar program. 
we actually wanted to do it the robots in agriculture no. this is one interesting area the drudgery of the work has to be reduced productivity has to be improved at the same time very small robots it is like your kitchen mixer kind of thing you know instead of a big you know bakery machine is so huge so you will think of reducing the size and to do a field work the pros marvel of is when he started in the statistical institute you know the his wife was having a big farm you know ancestral property and they used to go on weekends so they saw the harvesting by the bengali women the sickle which they were handling was so difficult for women to operate so then only he started the field of ergonomics you know you design things to suit the need of the people so this is what i think you have to come with original ideas of this kind of the so when you design competitions i think you have to think of all this yeah okay sure sure sir take down there we want to play your version of the story see uh, in between i i lost the connection i i, I believe that you asked about how to produce mass production right that was the question right then no no sir actually the question is like i mean so to say india has seen both the sides like i mean so to say few rich people those who have uh, enough food and probably the country with a lot of people those who don't have a food so how do you see what's the solution mass production or production by masses that means uh, a mass production in, in the probably like a corporate world etc etc or production by masses which is uh, distributed across the nation like in villages yeah so this is very interesting question uh, you know uh, as i mentioned my initial address okay, our agriculture land okay, that proposes is coming down you will notice that you know we were actually reducing it by making that you know urbanization like we are building today across india you say all the roads connected both the sides buildings are coming up earlier we used to see farming land now we are seeing only buildings what is that mean so now indians are ready to transform that their, their agriculture land into something else so that means the mass production only is a way so, so we need to take care of that so that is the reason the gmo concept is coming you know there are other concept vertical farming is there now uh, for farmers uh, you are question was so okay uh, basic farmers suppose you want to start some farming today people are talking about it you know all concepts but it's very difficult to manage water you know, to get a quality crop and grow it and sell it market it, all kind of you know challenges are there it is not that easy even if you want to sell you know a uh, small uh, brinjal or whatever it is but if you do mass production i am not suddenly way country like us we have 130 crore people and still growing to you know cope up that that would be right yeah uh, thank you thank you so much uh, sir for your answers i i think with the energy what you have i think we can take quite a lot of uh, questions but we are running short of time and i means always wondering why this ramesh sir has always uh, exponential ideas i think he might be sitting near to our vasakam sir i think uh, that might be the reason why he is getting quite a lot of ideas uh, i have to probably reserve a seat near to our vasakam sir i am also from the same uh, near point to district so i believe i will get a seat uh, next to you and now uh, i mean so to say we are i mean so to say about to conclude uh, this uh, nobel laureate lecture series 1 so we have introduced this nobel laureate lecture series as well as the lecture 1 today so in this regard i invite i can instruct meera misana madam to give her uh, remarks of uh, this event madam thank you selva sir uh, it's a pleasure to give the concluding marks of this uh, even as selva has said dream come true for the nobel laureate lecture that's what is the experience that we are feeling right now with kpr team and igen team we started with the felicitation address and uh, padma shri rm vasagam sir has rightly said that efficient use of land and water and resources management is the need of the hour and apj daud sir has said like ship to mouth existence is the need similarly we had a uh, governor who has come down for our event she has uh, presented us with the uh, notice uh, what are the various uh, schemes that are being introduced by our pmo office 
and at the same time uh, she has rightly said agriculture is the culture of the country and as india is developing country that is the need of our and with respect to it we had a nobel laureate giving a lecture on gmo the sustainable agriculture so he started with saying that 155 nobel laureates have supported gmo that is genetically modified organisms and he has said that to improve the plant health gmo is important and with respect to it the, the green peace is opposing the thought like food is the medicine and with respect to it he has said like though we started in 2013 the convincing of gmo but it formally was launched in 2016 so he has also presented how the evolution will be occurring from precision breeding to conventional breeding or what is the difference between conventional breeding and precision breeding with a perfect example of gps system that is the thing which is easily understandable by a common person the kids students and everything so though he is a nobel laureate he has expressed the things in a manner which can be understood by each and every person thereby he has also presented few case studies around eight case studies he has presented with the first one being keratin included in the rice can help in fighting the deficiency of vitamin a then he has said like though insulin is extracted from yeast it is also not being uh, opposed by the green peace because that is the need uh, of european or the developed countries then he talked about the green illusion then how the sweet pepper can be used to resist the banana prop talked about how the developing nations like kenya and uganda scientists have engineered it cbsv that is cassava resistant variety uh, to uh, fight the brown stick disease and with respect to the southern africa how they have developed about the fall army worm also was focused then he talked about our neighboring country bangladesh how the egg plant has been uh, the production has been improved by the bta technology so he has requested india also to remove the ban on the bta crops so it is the responsibility upon us to fight accord in the same lines to get the uh, sustainable agriculture and gmo crops into this and along with it he also mentioned about the rainbow papaya though that is a gmo product it is how highly utilized in usa but it is banned in thailand so it is a 77% engineered product so with respect to it he has said that it we need more science in politics and less politics in science that was his summary and he has said that food is a luxury for the developing countries not a problem for developed countries for developing countries the civil society must play its role thereby the media should pre- present science facts not science fiction so with respect to it we have said like gmo is safe and is a wonderful solution for sustainable agriculture and deepa he has patiently answered all the queries and he has said like life is all about taking risks so we have to be prepared to take the risks a seed grows with no sound but tree falls with huge noise destruction has noise but creation is quiet this is the power of silence so that's how the gmo has grown and ign is glad to be a part of uh, gmo activities and also is trying to achieve the sdg goals so we are working silently as a seed so that we'll be growing as a bigger tree and we'll be achieving the various activities in support of this anya from alantra tv and alexander also joined us with the queries so they were with us and always hope they will be with us and this is how the team of kpr has ca- conducted all the competitions and have uh, given the uh, seed from the kids to the all generations to be a part of the sustainable agriculture we are very very much thankful to vasagam sir who has not only answered the queries of the participants but has given the suggestions for the competitions and the need of innovativeness as doubt sir we you are a part of us 
So with respect to it, you have also presented how vertical farming and other techniques which are very useful and need of the hour you are presenting. Thank you very much, sir, for your wonderful awareness for, for us. I'm thankful for IGN team for giving me this opportunity to sum up all about this event. Thank you, Ramesh, sir, and thank you, team. Thank you. Thank you so much, madam. There is an always a saying, the best teacher in the world is uh, the teacher student. And I believe uh, means the way you have captured the uh, means points from uh, our Nobel laureate lecture, I think uh, the summary what you have made, uh, that's, that's amazingly brilliant. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, madam. Yeah. I think Hudson is clapping so that... Uh, that uh, is, uh, thank, you, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> so that says the, the effort what you put in. So I think, I mean, so say, there is an always an amazing thought, as I already told, this, I personally felt this is almost next to impossible, but uh, uh, the woman behind this is uh, none other than Dr. Aguila, Principal KPRIET, Organizing Secretary IGEN, NLS, uh, Madam, I expect your Organizing Secretary remarks, uh, probably the journey which you have walked throughout, and uh, it's finally we are here on the day. Yes, Madam, please. Yes, yes. Thank you, Selva. And uh, this event, August uh, 25th event, uh, started uh, three months back in a small way, telling that uh, can we conduct uh, a program with uh, Nobel laureate, and followed by a brief dis uh, um, discussion with uh, Dr. Ramesh and uh, Subhashree. It was. It started very casually, and uh, once Richard sir told that uh, he will be able to uh, participate as the first Nobel laureate um, speaker, we we were so grateful. They rolled on just two months. Uh, then we started rolling our wheels, and initially uh, we had some uh, discussion that uh, how to go about, who will all participate in this and uh, how to take it internationally, whether we'll, uh, whether we'll have a, a good uh, uh, participants all around the globe. So those all things came into hands and we were very lucky to partner with many of the people in India and across the globe. So I like to mention here some of the people. Uh, I gratefully acknowledge to our IGEN Nobel Laureate uh, Lecture Series Campaign Ambassadors first, Gunashegar, Ashwini, Tejashvi, Arun Kumar, Dr. Shivasis Roy, Kirti Poga, Yashwantini, yeah. Arun Kumar, uh, Bhavan Chitkar, Amujiri Bishwanath, and Dr. Kishrat Mirsana, and uh, followed by Arjun Chetri, Baninder Singh, Abhishek, Sharan Sanjeev. And uh, these, these are all people uh, uh, in India. And we had ambassadors, and who you would, they would have been mentioned in our bites session in video. We we had people who have given their video bites, um, uh, sharing our thoughts through promotions across the globe. Um, we had participants from 28 countries in in doing the promotional activity, and uh, I I should thank as an organizational secretary uh, for. Uh, all the ambassadors who were who were along with uh, IGEN LLS for campaigning. And as far as uh, other uh, IGEN founders, uh, they are the backbone of this event, starting uh, all the nine founders and other uh, board of governors, board of advisors have been along with them, along with us uh, from the start until today, they are here as the heart of the program IGEN NLSS. And uh, I should thank here our uh, chair, my chairman, Dr. K. P. Ramasamy sir, for agreeing to be the academic partner for this event. And uh, our KPR team, Dr. N. G. Sumitra, Dr. K. Vishnu Kumar, K. S. Tamil Chilvan, Balaji Chandran, Pradeep Karthi, Kudai Kumar, Sudha Priya, Prisda Karthigayan, Sumesh Vasnasilan, Bharatwaj Navamani, Divya Devi, and HODs of all departments and followed by IT team of KPRIT who was uh, uh, making ready all the uh, presentations, uh, video and today's program also. Followed by, I have a uh, powerful IT team with me, Karthik, 
am Perumal, A O A M, and all the people. And here we have a shutdown now, but our generator is running. So because of our electrician and so many people who are behind this event success. So uh, the web page design started with the web page design, the registration, the promotions, and uh, pre-event uh, one was hosted by a KPR, and the pre-event two by Gokul, and the pre-event three by Selva. So the team behind so uh, Gokul and Selva Jyoti. I don't have words to say how much time we have spent. Mostly midnights. Most of our nights are gone, and most fruitful discussion will start after nine o'clock. So from nine, even it will go up to two o'clock. And the master brain behind this, Dr. L. Ramesh. So I thank Dr. L. Ramesh, President Igen, for guiding us and being the shooting star and uh, having a one great event today, which is, which is possible amid COVID-19. I thank Selva for giving me the opportunity to thank everyone who are involved in this Igen Nobel Laureate Lecture Series. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, madam. As you rightly pointed out, I mean, so to say, there are n number of people behind the success of the event. Even I have received the SMS about this event from at least means so to say seven eight ambassadors, those who are probably promoting the event. Now I think the session is probably open for the forum. Those people are in Google Meet, which you can give your wishes or probably about the event if you want to take. Maybe 30 seconds to a minute. The session floor is open. Hey, let me start, uh, Selva. Yes, sir. Uh, it's our pleasure. Sir. It's our pleasure. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Principal Madam KPRT, for doing a wonderful job. And uh, thank you, Ramesh, sir, for inviting me to this wonderful opportunity. Really, thank you. And Google G, because you know, we, uh, myself, Google, and you know, Ramesh, we work on different projects and we connect. But this is an awesome program. Actually, uh, the Nobel lecture actually it's a need of the time. Uh, really, really, it's a need. And we are heading towards a food crisis. We don't believe we are heading towards that. If we are not changing our direction, our thoughts and thinking, we will, we will have a big challenge to address it because the food is not enough for the entire world. So the, let's see how the governments and other organizations take it forward. And I really like it. And it's a wonderful program. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Dawood sir. And I think still there are people sir waiting in YouTube. Yes, uh, I request all the participants to even stay connected till the end. Uh, we should say there are quite a lot of upcoming events as well. Uh, so we should say without you, I mean, should say whatever the things which you are doing is of no use. Uh, so please, uh, I mean, thanks a lot for staying connected even after posting the feedback link. Uh, this is a true crowd uh, which uh, means what they really enjoy our session. Thank you so much for that. What I will try to do during the course of this talk is to give you some idea of how I came to win the Nobel Prize, kinds of things that I found to be important. And I'm hoping that along the way, I can highlight one or two of the things that I learned as a result of being a student and following this path that I think can really be useful to a lot of people, to a lot of you. I'm very, very keen always on following your passion. If you have something you love to do, try and make a career of it. And the great thing about it is if after two or three years you get passionate about passionate about something else, follow that. Don't don't think that because you've started in a particular path that you have to follow it. Do things that are dangerous, you know? Danger is a good thing. Almost everything worth doing in life is risky. I always think about skiing, you know, skiing is a great sport, but it's an accident waiting to happen. You do it until you have your accident, and then you stop, and then you do something else. Life is, almost everything in life really worth doing is a little bit risky. When experiments fail in this kind of situation, it's one of the greatest things that can happen. Failure is a great thing because it's telling you one of two things. Either you screwed up, maybe you dropped the sample on the floor, or just didn't lay it up properly. But maybe nature is trying to tell you something. And in this case, nature was trying to tell us something very big. 